I know you, you go all in with your business and you're all over the place on the road a ton. How do you balance that with your kids, your family? Uh, that, yep. I just, that's a big question for me. By not overjudging myself and by being aware that it's gonna ebb and flow, you know, um, some days are gonna be a 15 hour day when you have a business because what people that don't have businesses don't realize is your business is the other child. You know, and it's also the child that feeds your actual child. <laughs> and so, you know, I think that people are like, oh man, like they can never say like, oh my God, I'm gonna pick my business over my child. But the reality is there's not an entrepreneur on the planet that has it in the micro, not in the macro. And so it's a game of not beating yourself up, brother. Like you have God willing the next 70 years at least maybe 80 given how young you are in modern medicine to spend time with that child. And so, you know, nobody wants to miss an hour here or an hour there. Who wants to miss their kid's first step or their first word? Nobody wants to miss a recital or a big game and you fight for those things. I always, always fight for those things. But if the occasional scenario pops up where I don't have the opportunity to attend something because I, there's a critical moment in a business that is very important. I'm not going to beat myself up and say that I'm not a good dad. And, you know, I didn't even see my dad the first 13 years of my life because he worked so much because we just came to America and he's the best dad and we have the greatest relationship. So I'm, as you can imagine, I'm not scared of it. Yeah. No, thank you. And, you know, I had that conversation with my my wife, I was like, babe, we're on, we're on team well. I'm like, when, when you're at home and you're taking care of the kid, and yes, those are those harder times when I'm away, you're allowing me to go out there and have impact and meet people and change the world and be able to build our legacy. And so when you think about it in that form, like that's really helped our relationship grow to that next level. Like, babe, we're doing this together. We're having impact together. Even though you're sitting home with the child and I'm out, you know, hanging out with David Meltzer and being able to speak with you and, and get the message out. So it's like, we're still just all rolling in the same direction. And we're yeah, realistic. Oh, by the way, oh, oh, by, oh, by the way, oh, by the way, like the luck, the incredibleness of raising a child is way cooler than talking to Gary Vee and David Meltzer. For sure. <laughs> and But to that same point, when your kids get older and I have three teenage, 23, 21, and 18, and one actually works with me now, you know, just be realistic. They don't want to F and spend all their time with you either. <laughs> you know, I, I beg for well, two minutes that, a day and I'm cool with it. Yeah. That, well, that, that, that starts transitioning around 13 where kids become the, their friends become their primary life, not their parents. So I will say for young parents, you know, milk as much as you can out of one through 13. Dave, I'm sure you feel this. I already feel it in some ways. Milk as much of that time when we were the center of their world, because you're right, it flips. You know, for, for now you have parents, I mean, there's only, I mean, at this point in my career, the only person I can think of that doesn't pick up my call is my daughter. <laughs>Another thing that you're very clear on is is hustling, working hard, uh, hard work ethic. I think hard but work matters. I, I agree with you, but there's this whole wave, I, I don't there's, know if you've seen, of people coming in now. Are you kidding? Of, of I'm saying, the one who's fucking work, No, work-life balance. Of course. That I'm you shouldn't work, work hard. I'm the one hard. that gets picked on for that because the manifestation of me believing in hard work has been, you know, I say that I sleep six, seven, and eight hours and that nobody should do anything that doesn't make them happy and that making $47,000 a year and being happy is amazing and yet people want to make me the poster child of overworking and burning yourself out. I get it. I understand what happens once you hit a certain tier. I also understand that maybe I could have done a better job earlier in the process of my career in creating clarification. Thus, I'm okay with getting link baited into some of these conversations. But um, listen, I believe in work-life balance. I just think my work-life balance is different than yours. I also think that happiness needs to be thought about. And like, when you love what you do, like, this is my hobby. You also have to know what you want, right? If, Correct. If, if, if you and wanna be a billionaire, you're not gonna do it yeah, by and, just and by the sleeping way, all day. Let me say it one more time, because I've gotta clarify it all the fucking time. <laughs> I'll say it for the 9,000th fucking time. The pursuit of trying to buy the New York Jets is my passion because it allows me to play the game that I love. I love being a businessman the way a lot of you love playing football, the way a lot of you love to ski, the way a lot of you love to read, the way a lot of you love to cook, watch Netflix, hang out with your friends. If given the option, besides garage sailing and watching the Jets,
professionally, forget about family, that's on a pedestal that nothing can touch. Outside of spending time with my inner family and closest friends, and outside of garage selling and watching the Jets, there's nothing I'd rather do than work a 15 hour day. You're self aware, you know you. And I always have. This is why I shoveled snow and did lemonade. And I washed fucking cars as a seven year old all day long on August 9th, because it's what I like. And I'm not gonna judge somebody who wants to work nine to five, be on 13 fucking softball teams and play fucking video games all day and make 42K a year. If she and he are pumped as fuck, they're equal to me because I know a bunch of miserable fucking billionaires and I know a lot of fucking happy 55K a years and everything in between. So here's my thing. If you listen carefully, I'm only spitting two core things. You be self-aware and you make yourself happy and don't let anything other variables, you adjust to macro variables. And two, this is what makes me happy. A lot of people are spitting their ideology on other people, especially after they've already accomplished something. I'm curious, for people who are trying to find meaning in life, to, to live a meaningful life, what would you say to them? I think a couple things, you know, this, it's a very heavy question. I think people, first of all, have to give a lot more thought to the environment and the parents that raised them. There's a lot of answers in there. Like a lot. Uh, so that's interesting to me. That's just one hot take. I believe one of the great ways to mix things up is what you listen to and who you surround yourself with. Um, I would, I'm unbelievably passionate about people finding more optimistic, practical friends. And I, and I think optimism gets, can, get, can slide into delusion which is why I say optimistical, practical. You know, uh, it's funny, as you were talking about minimalism, like I didn't, it, it's so interesting that you're the first person to ever say it to me that I can recall, and it feels very real to me. Like, I don't have outside things kind of driving me, and that's what leads me to a lot of happiness. And so, I, I would say auditing your circle. Like, if somebody wants a meaning, meaningful life, live a live, meaningful life, leave, just get happier. I think the people that you spend your time with is a big one. The amount of people listening right now who've got a mother who's super pessimistic and cynical but they love their mother and they don't realize that cutting down their time from seven hours a week of engagement with their mother to two and adding, like going out of their way to seeing the person that's always smiling in the office and trying to spark up a friendship and become friends with that person and cutting up that seven hours a week from mom to two to mom, maybe 30 minutes with that person and maybe reallocating the other hours to themselves or other things is a massive deal. It's a massive deal. Like, there's only offense and defense. There's only the force and the dark side, right? And I think that um, right now people are, are, a lot of people are choosing to be driven by fear and negativity without realizing it. And so if you're listening right now, my biggest thing is start leaning into a little bit more of optimism and positivity. I think where it overcorrects is when it goes into delusion and that's when you start creating entitlement. And that is the tightrope that I've been talking about, thinking about, watching. Um, and it's, I, I create entitlement a lot of times because I like positivity mm. and it took me a little while, maybe 20 or 30 years, 20 years of operating and managing and parenting and being like, okay, I, <laughs> I can see this, but I'm, not, but I'm a product of not having entitlement. Everyone's talking about this Lego video that here's a guy who's leading the way of entrepreneurship and yet you're talking about like $2,000 that you made on eBay for Legos, you know, what is it in your personality? There's a definition of a serial entrepreneur. You don't give a shit about how big the project is. You are completely obsessed with the idea of buying and selling and creating margin. And I'm obsessed with the responsibility of having people be attached to the message that I'm putting out there. Beautiful. In a time where I'm incredibly concerned about interest rates and how much VC money there is and consumer confidence, knowing that people have all sorts of stuff in their house that's worth money or the ability to go to a garage sale tomorrow and buy stuff that's worth money inspires me. And whether it's closing a 
$25 million deal for VaynerMedia or buying something for a dollar and selling it for $7 on eBay. For me, it's one in the same game. And when you have millions of people following you, tens of millions of people following you, I, I, I'm surprised by how many people don't understand you have the responsibility of providing value to them, not them giving you likes and follows. And, and so for me, to your point, I'll be as excited to make a video about a CNBC article about flipping Legos as I will about telling people four years ago that if they bet the farm on TikTok, things can work out for them and everything in between. And um, while it's now 4.42 p.m. on the East Coast as we're filming this, while spending, I don't know, six hours today with Fortune 100 companies on their macro global marketing plans. And so I have a lot of flexibility in my entrepreneurship now that I got the gray hairs and I try to use all those skills on a daily basis. You got your start actually stocking shelves at your parents' liquor store. And in 96, you rebranded, renamed it, and you launched one of the first and, and certainly one of the most successful uh, e-commerce liquor stores in the country at the time. This is really early in the dot-com kind of bubble and boom, um, but it worked out for you. So back then when everyone was doing it and you, you stood out, what, what's the biggest takeaway you had from then? And what's the lesson that really sticks out even today from that? That, that became the first grown-up uh, example of my intuition of what people were gonna do even though smarter, older, wealthier, more accomplished people told me that they weren't. That was the first example, if I'm recapping it, that I could point to that said, in a big boy version, I was right, the incumbents were not. And the reason I say big boy Prior to that, I had been doing you know, a lot of things from age 11 to 21 in sports cards, comic books, collectible toys, and I made a lot of decisions during that 10-year window that were countercultural to what people thought. I sold my entire baseball card collection six months before the market crashed and put it into comics and collectible toys, and those markets exploded. That was the first young boy version of me being wildly right when people were like, why are you selling cards? It's the hottest. And all of that on both scenarios, my friend, came down to me watching real people at scale instead of trying to look at reports or, or and here's a big one for a lot of people on this stream or watching this video. Um, I didn't allow where I was making money to dictate what I thought was gonna happen tomorrow. That's a big one. I, even though I was making a lot of money, a couple thousand bucks a weekend in sports cards, which by the way, still feels like a trillion. I, I still don't make that kind of money. Um, uh, I was like, these people are not as interested. The fever's gone. People are talking more about Star Wars and Spider-Man than Frank Thomas and Ken Griffey. I'm feeling something. Half my class that was into cards isn't anymore. And it's not just because they're into girls now, like, because they're still into video games. Like, I just, and I do that all the time. It's how I do everything to, to this day. So in 96, that was really betting the farm. I asked my dad for $15,000 to build winelibrary.com. That felt like a trillion, just to give everyone context on a small business for something that seemed, that'd be like asking a company today, a small business for like 15,000, $200,000 to build a metaverse, right? It just seemed crazy. The reason the dot-com thing felt right, whereas I wouldn't ask a small business to build a metaverse for 200K today, was I felt we were close enough to people actually buying wine on the internet. And, um, and, and that's how I saw it. And I thought the internet thing was gonna be the biggest thing. And, uh, and that was because I was watching people, not just my friends, but I noticed my friend's mom created email to email her son at college. And then I would listen and I would hear that his mom said now she's emailing with her sister. And they're 47, and this is 1996, I'm like, huh, like there's things I hear that people do that very quickly my chemicals tell me everyone's gonna do that, not just them. And that was that example. And that has become the formula of my career. Um, listen to real people every day. Don't let the way I'm making my money or how I hope to make my money uh, or my success or my, or my joy, right? Some people don't do things because they don't like it. It doesn't matter if I don't like 
posting pictures on Instagram. People want to consume pictures on Instagram. My family took 25 photos in our lifetime. <laughs> like we were a non-photo family. So Instagram was hard for me. I mean it. The thought of taking a picture is just, to this day, is foreign. So um, that's how I think about it. You're on YouTube pretty much daily for around five years doing these long form episodics you on camera, something that people really weren't doing back, I mean, this is months to maybe a year after YouTube launches, right? So you're really early in that game um, and you're doing it by yourself. You're, you're consistently telling people, especially people who are posting videos, don't worry about your audience, don't worry about your likes, don't worry about your subscribers. So what was this experience like for you early on, just one guy talking to a camera back then? That was the biggest, mo that February 20th, 2006 or 21st, I always get confused, I think it's 21st. That was, um, that's one of the most significant business days of my life, right? Um, I say business because I think so much of what makes me work is realizing family and real life is real life and business, even though I'm passionate about it and people know I'm passionate about it, is a very different, is a game in a lot of ways. But that was one of the most, it may be top three most significant business days of my life because I'm 30 years old at this point and there's not a thought in my mind that ever is thinking that anybody on earth is gonna know who I am outside of the wine and spirits. Or I did have bigger aspirations, but business people, right? Like business stuff, not like normal people knowing who I am. And that started the journey of normal people knowing who I am and it started the journey of me enjoying communicating around complicated subjects. Wine is very complex. It's extremely intimidating. Most of the people watching right now don't drink as much wine as they could be because it is a little too intimidating. They actually think they have to know something to even drink it, which is something we don't do in many other categories of consumption. So demystifying wine was a huge thing for me because remember, I'm 30 now. I've been building this big business for my dad for the last eight years. I want all my 20-year-old friends to care about it and none of them, brother, could care about it. There wasn't 20 year olds in the late 90s, early 2000s that could give a crap about wine. It's much cooler now. The NBA, I think, has made it cooler. Sideways, the movie came along. A lot of things, two buck chuck, a million things happened that made wine more interesting for 20 year olds. But outside of highly wealthy, generational wealthy kids in their 20s, almost no other 20 year old paid attention to wine, like real wine, not like Franzi in a box or something like that, right? So. I wanted to demystify it and I learned so much. The comments, uh, long form video, creative. I learned a lot about myself, which was I was a captivated communicator and I later built on that to create opportunities. Um, that was one of the great learning. And I'll tell you what I really learned from episode one on. And I we actually just did this as a team. We cut a clip where I kind of, I made the first episode thinking I was gonna do QVC a couple minutes into the episode, I realized I was doing 1970s, 1950s news, when news used to be a public service product, not an entertainment product. And so I thought I was going in with the most selfish intent. Episode one of Wine Library TV was built to sell wine on the internet. I was gonna do QVC. I'm gonna take wines, I'm gonna tell you what to buy. Immediately within the first episode, within the first 10 minutes, within the first five minutes, you, I think you just did the one, right? Within the first five minutes, you could see me kind of look to the side and I, could, and I didn't recall when I did it, but then the team just showed me the video. I, I was like, uh-oh, I need to review wine and bring them value, not me value. And I gotta tell them the truth because I don't love every wine we sell. And by the way, that doesn't mean that I'm right because everyone has a different palate. And it took the show to the stratus where people were, like people were flabbergasted that I was the owner of this store selling these wines and telling people not to buy the wine. My dad is still my dad is still flabbergasted that I did that. You know, I think I've been a great salesman my whole life because I don't sell things that I don't believe in. You know, I believe that Empathy Wines is a dramatically better $20 wine than most $20 wines in the market. I know that because I know the sources of the grapes and things of that nature. But I also think that Maggie, who I adore sitting here, she may like a $7 wine better than Empathy. That's okay. There are, I, you know, but I think, to, and this is actually, like, I'll be honest with you, this is actually where I've had a little bit of, I don't have a whole lot of problems with the people in the industry, right? Even though we were like renegades and people would razz me, I always understood. But the one thing that did always bother me is, 
you know, after four glasses of wine, mainly rosé at Cannes, a lot of these people who would publicly post nasty things about me or razz me in meetings would kind of get just tipsy enough to say, you're onto something or you're right. And I would ask them, it was always, that's always so nice. So I'm incredibly, I try to be remarkably gracious in those moments. Because I think all the things that have worked for me is the byproduct of my parents and the luck of my DNA draw. So I don't get too high on my Gary Vee supply. I, I say to them, I'm like, why are you selling something you don't believe in? And I know the answer. People have lives and they have, this is what, where they find themselves and they have mortgages and kids. Like, you know, you know, I get it, but there's so many people that could be doing other things outside of Madison Avenue. Now with us, I think there'll be a lot of, copycatting of us in the next decade so there'll be alternatives to like, you know, what's most important to me? That I believe in it. Like I believe that I am going to build one of the most significant intellectual properties of all time. I really believe that. I really believe that Practical Peacock can be like Lisa Simpson one day. I really believe that. And so, as you can imagine, that gives me the energy to go so hard, to believe, like I'm really into it. And so you've got to believe in what you, you know, I believe the case with sneaker at that $40 price range is as good of an alternative as another sneaker. And if you choose to like believe in the mission statement of the sneakers, which is be kind, be practical, you know, if you see something in front of you that you want, it's gonna take work ethic, not burning out, but work ethic, you know, and things like that. So I always believe in the stuff I sell, the Gary Vee stuff. I believe that my mom is the greatest mom of all time. I believe that. I believe other moms have come along that tie my mom because they also are 100% about their children but also not delusional and keep it in this great mix of like self-esteem building but not entitlement building which is impossible. Trust me, I don't think I'm good at it with my kids, I get it. It's hard. Um, So I believe in the things that I talk about, patience and kindness but I do believe in tenacity and, and competition. So I, I live in this world, and I'll use America, I live in this world that is desperately trying to make the world about red or blue, and every day pushes more red or blue, and I know the answer is purple, right? Look at me, I, I, as a marketing proxy, I think the Super Bowl is the number one ad in marketing, the best ad you can buy, right? Even though I'm very anti other television. I think you need to think about, I think you need to think about tasting everything because you're a young man and you want to figure out what the hell you like and what you're good at. There's just an incredible, you know, like kind of access point of like what you're great at and what you love. When you stumble into being somebody like me, you really win. When what you're naturally great at is what you naturally love the most and away you go. The amount of people that I meet every day that are great at something but have no interest in being a CFO. They love, they're insane with numbers, but they don't want to do it. They want to sing, right? Or, you know, like, and so that's tough. You see it in athletics. Like, people don't understand athletes. The amount of athletes that just do it because it was the best way, in the same way that somebody goes and becomes an accountant, and they don't love competition, and they don't love the sport. It's crazy. You know, when you look at them, because you're like, you're one of the 15 best, you know, and they don't love it, which is why they're not the greatest athlete of all time. The greatest athletes of all time are the ones who love it and have it. And so I think what you need to do is taste everything. It's kind of like food. You don't know what your favorite food is if you only eat one food. So I would take advantage of your youth and, uh, and your flexibility at this kind of age and try to taste everything play with everything, figure out what you might be good at, what you might like, and then you make a decision. You know, when I think about being 41 years old and feeling as young as I, I feel like I'm 10 years old. Like I feel like I have my whole life in front of me. And I think it's very difficult for youngsters to realize that. I'm sure some of us that have lived a little bit longer, you know, you just don't, like when I was 20, how old are you? When I was 26, 41 seemed like a fucking long way away. You know, like, like my, my, eight, my eight, year old cousin, eight years older cousin who worked with me at Wine Library seemed old to me. At, you know, he was 34 when I was 26, so 41, fuck. Like, like it's funny for me to think about like how you're seeing me, but I'm telling you, you're gonna feel exactly the way you feel right now at 41. And so that's interesting because when people understand that, you can start deploying more patience. Because right now you want to prove it. 
You've got, right? Yeah, quickly. You know, I can read that because you're in the fake, like first words out of your mouth always are such an indicator of what's on your mind. You know, I don't, I never cared to fake it till I made it because I didn't care what people thought. When you can eliminate that, shit changes real quick. You know, even think about high school and then going into college, like high school's so tough for people because it's the apex of when everything's about what other people think. And then you love the transition to university or the last year of high school because you care a little less, right? But those first couple years of high school, I don't know the school system exactly how you guys do it here, but like, ev- like everybody's wrapped up in that 12 to 17 year old age of like everything's about what everybody else thinks and that's why so many people hate that era. I just never went through that luckily, just hardwiring, good parenting, serendipity, circumstance, wrapping my self esteem in things that I was great at. Not really, I'm not really good at thinking about what I'm bad at. Even in interviews, the only time I get stumped is they're like, what do you struggle with? Or, or what, what's a failure? I'm like, uh, I just don't even like quantify it. I don't think it's worth it. I think people dwell too much. I give away all my best advice. I'm sh- at Daily V, I'm showing inside meetings to what the strategy of my company is and my competitors can just watch it and copy it. I mean, it's crazy what I'm actually doing because it speaks to my confidence that I'm always gonna keep inventing the next thing and my understanding that 99% of people aren't gonna do anything about it anyway. Um, so I just bought Pure Wow, which is a women's media publishing company. It's like a Refinery29 competitor. I saw the Refinery29 CEO at CS and I rolled up on him and we've been friends for a long time, acquaintances, friendly. And he had, he, he had a good vibe, but like I addressed it in media. I'm like, listen, you know I wanna rip your head off. Like that, I'm competitive, it's a game. Like that's what I do. I'm like, but, but then I said to him, you know, but, but honestly, I think we should join up and we should go after Condé Nest and, and Hearst and there's much bigger media women companies than us. Together we can really do some damage and I don't care if I get 50 cents or 30 cents on the dollar. I, I think the best collaborations are the most unlikely. When Burger King asked McDonald's on that, like that campaign they did, I don't know if you guys saw this, where they asked to make a, a love child of the Big Mac and the Whopper. To me, there's, if tomorrow Nike and Adidas in the height of Yeezys going after the Nike brand did a collaboration, to me, you even said it, the most unlikely ones. It's easy when a crayon company does a JV with like a sock company and they make a co-pack. Like, they're not really competing. I think the most interesting ones are when you have real genuine competition and people collaborate Uh, And so I think the ones that are most interesting is when Facebook and Snapchat will have secret meetings and say, you know what, we have to team up on vertical video because that's bigger than what we're competing against each other because we have to take down television ads. That's interesting, you know, I love that stuff. You know, I know that's pretty frothy, but I think that's when it gets most interesting. That, so, so FedEx and UPS should get together and say, listen, Amazon and Uber are dangerous. What can we do together? Disrupt the disruptors. And it's most interesting to me when the incumbents that are on the verge of being disrupted are smart enough to disrupt. So like for example, every hotel company in, a, in the world should have gotten together, threw money together, and then bought residential and then created an Airbnb competitor. You know what I mean? That to me is really neat. Now I know that's pretty heady. On a more small business level, I think it gets really interesting when the next generation comes in and they yell at their father that not everything is competition and you can do business with the guy down the street. My best collaborations was when I had no money. When Wine Library had no money, none. We were doing $3.8 million, $3. million a year, 10% gross profit before expense. We had no money, there was no marketing budget. My first year's marketing budget was $14,000. What did I do? I went to a lot of the other local businesses in Milburn and asked them if I could put a bottle of wine on their counter at the barber shop with little coupons. So why do you think all those people back? I mean, you're, you're Gary Vee. Right? Yes. So, and you've always had that. Yes. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna fix it. Yes. Up. Why do you think holds people back from those? Hum, where, where human inefficiencies. Yeah. Fear, ego. Yeah. I don't need you. I can do it. Uh, uh, Cynicism, I don't trust you. You're not gonna leave, when I leave, you're gonna just take the flyers. 
to throw them in the garbage and drink my wine. That's what holds my dad back. Cynicism, you know? Yeah, cynicism. You talk a lot about young people not having you know, patience. Yes. Uh, what do you think are the other major factors that young people don't really have to help Experience. You know, I think, I think young kids are getting tricked right now and think just because it's a technology boom and just because they understand it that they have this great advantage over 45-year-old executors. It's audacity, which I love. Channeled properly, it gives them the lack of fear to do things. So I really don't talk a lot about it because I don't want to stop it because I think it's their greatest gift as well. But I think it's patience. I think it's lack of experience. And the biggest one is lack of talent. Every young kid thinks they're entitled to be an entrepreneur now. It's the cool thing. Truth is, it's not gonna work out. Like, it just isn't, the math doesn't work out. Like, 98% of the people that are starting startups are gonna lose. And again, the reason I started with the economic, like, the economic growth of the globe is keeping a fake entrepreneur alive. Most of your friends that in their 20s that have businesses are actually making money if they're in tech. They've raised capital and they're losing money every month. That's ultimately something that doesn't work out. Second question, sorry. Uh, a lot of the time I do web design development well for small businesses. A lot of the time I can go in, I can show a portfolio, I can say I want to expand that portfolio and they still might choose paying like 5,000 euro ridiculous amounts of money when I can say I can do the same work, here's the work that I've done. Is there any way of combating that? No. no. You're, being, you're being subjected to age discrimination. So the way to combat it is to not dwell on it and not try to sell people who aren't sellable. It's a volume game. Just go to every business instead of focusing on trying to convince the dog shop owner that he's making a mistake. Though one of the great things I've always done, because I started off as a young kid and nobody, I mean, I, I started off as like, they would walk into my family business and I'm like, can I help you with wine? And they're like, you can't help me with wine. For the first seven years they were right, I was 15 years old, they made, they were, but I knew a lot more and if they gave me data I could tell them what they should drink. But I think that um, one thing I learned very early on by all that rejection, both being a bad student and both being a kid that tried to sell wine when he was underage and nobody would listen to him, is that, is that you can't sell people that aren't sellable. You're way better off putting your energy and crushing it for the people that give you an at-bat, right, versus the people that aren't. And so what I would do if I were you guys is I would shift into the mindset of thinking that you're a media company, comma, NGO. And what that would do, and I actually think that's the advice I'd give all of you. So I think you should blog every day about the world of preschool and art, like everything. Profile a teacher, speak about something that happened 50 years ago, a media company. If you all think of yourself as a media company, media content is the gateway to the business. Look what I do. I, Gary, am a media company it's the gateway to building the fastest, biggest growing agency in the history of advertising. <laughs> I always say to people, if they really pay attention to what I'm doing, they'll get much more value out of me than anything else. Like, why am I making so much video? Why am I documenting everything? Why am I you know, producing a t-shirt? Why am I doing the Apple show? Why, why am I doing what I'm doing? No matter. I'll never be as, as great as a communicator as I am, right? And I'm really good at it, and that's why I've been successful. I'll never be able to fully synthesize ahead of my own actions. So what does that mean? That means you should write a Medium blog post every week. It means that you should do a podcast in the NGO space every week. Why did Scott Harrison and Adam Braun from Pop and Pencils of Promise, excuse me, Pencil Promise and Charity Water become such players? Because they were, they were club promoters, they were marketers, they, were, they, they treated it differently. And, and the truth is, too many people in the NGO, spo, NGO space take for granted people's goodwill. They think just because they're an NGO, people should give a shit. There's a trillion NGOs. There's a trillion things that are trying to do good for the world. So content, podcast, video, written, quotes, pictures. Because the alternative of it being wrong never scared me because I don't value somebody's opinion who's watching me in the stands while I'm on the field.
Mm. Let's let me say that nice and slow for everybody. The thought that your partner, your brother, your spouse, your aunt, your mother, your best friend has judgment of what you're doing on the field of play is asinine. They are a spectator eating popcorn, watching you work. I that's it. I don't know what else to tell you. Like if it if it failed, <laughs> if it failed, it failed within my own mind. I was disappointed. I was, I was rarely confused. I'm, you know, when my stuff fails, I'm like, ah, it was this. You know, so I'm 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 pretty good like that. That's about accountability. People are always trying to blame somebody else. I'm focused on blaming myself all the time. Um, and you learn, you learn. You know, again, back to all those reps. This was the childhood, you know, I did a, a, t- a godly amounts of things wrong as a child. Baseball card shows, the liquor store. But by the time I even got into my 20s, then through my 20s and the 30s, tons of things wrong. I'm just refined right now. I'm 46 going on 96, you know? And so there's a lot of experience in, in there. And most importantly, I still make mistakes every day. I still make mistakes every day. I just don't dwell on them. I just don't, I can't wrap my head around the logic of why. Mm. Like, I I watch people very carefully. People are fundamentally insecure and overvalue other people's opinions. And it leads to incredibly vulnerable behavior. And I just want people to put themselves on the highest pedestal. And it doesn't mean you have an ego. It means you just chosen to love yourself. <laughs> like everybody sucks at stuff too. That's very true. I think that I think that's just a great way to look at at things. When you kind of touched on passion a little early earlier, and you mentioned a lot of different subjects, Power Rangers and whatnot, right? Um, uh, baseball cards when you were younger. Uh, you know, building your dad's liquor store. What what is the actual passion of yours at that age? Was it growing? It was helping operations. My parents. I, I was obsessed with my parents. I'm still obsessed with my parents. I was obsessed that they did it for me. They they left this bad place. They had nothing. They just grinded. We went on. I went on one. I went on two, two family vacations in my entire childhood. Mm. Like, you know, they sacrificed, and I I knew I was talented. I knew, I knew it. You know, like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, it's why I associate with entertainers and athletes so much. They're the ones who knew at seven or 10 or, let me just break it to you. Beyonce knew. She knew. She knew at 11, she was going to be a superstar. LeBron knew. And and I knew. I knew that I was going to be an all-time great businessman. I just did. I knew it. I don't even know how else to explain it to you. I just knew. Yeah. And and it was important to me to do right by my parents. You know, when I tell the kids to be patient, you have time to get yours. I worked every day from 22 to 34 for my father, never made more than $100,000 a year. And that was the last year I worked for him. Every other year, I was in the 40s and 50K a year until I opened up my mouth out of disgust because I took his business from a $3.8 million business to a $65 million business. I, I gave up my entire 20s and early 30s for my parents. I love when people try to razz on me. Don't listen to Gary Vee's parents. I'm like, you have no fucking idea what you're talking about. I made my parents rich. I'm proud of that. You know, towards, and I wanna be transparent here because I know that actually there's some people that maybe are debating family, like towards my early 30s into, into like before I left and AJ grew up, like I started having resentment towards my dad. I built the whole damn business. I was like, dad, what the fuck? Like, give me a piece of this business. He's like, you'll get it when I die. I'm like, you're gonna die at 90, I'm gonna be 70. <laughs> you know? And so, and so, but you know, I that resentment changed as I got worldly. As I got older, as I saw the world, I'm like, wait, he was just in the old school immigrant mindset, right? You know, family business, I run it, I die, you take it. And so, you know, that's why I'm glad I was able to work through that with myself, really, um, but, but yeah, I was just, what drove me back then was giving back to my parents. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. No, that's and I knew, and, and, and I loved being able to be the guy. 
you know, one of the other reasons my dad and I had friction towards the end was I became the guy. Mm. Every liquor company, every winery, everybody in the industry was like, Gary, Gary, Gary. And my dad started to feel like a schlemiel. There was this great thing he used to say to me of why he would be upset. He would say, he would say it in Russian and it would translate to, I'm just a senator with an empty briefcase. Ooh. And what that translated to in Russia, everything was black market and all, you know, and what was in the briefcase was cash and you would trade it for, you know, life, right? And no, by the way, no different in America, just does, does they just do it different. And so, um, you know, my, my, it was tough for my dad. He said, you know, I'm a senator. Yeah, I'm the owner of the store, but nobody fucking talks to me because I have no money in the fucking briefcase. And so he felt less like a man. I felt like I wasn't getting compensated my impact towards the end. And it was really healthy for me. To, thank God I had an 11 year younger brother who I wanted to do a business with in my lifetime. And it kind of worked out. Absolutely. Well, let's shift our conversation to that a little bit with with Vayner, Vayner Media specifically. You were at the at the time you were doing the wine library, right? Primarily, I, I think that, if I'm not mistaken, that was also for your father, um, essentially, to build sort of a brand around um, getting yes, people thank, to get thank, to them. Yeah, thank you for knowing that. I knew that when I was gonna leave my dad's store, which I always knew would happen, mm -hmm. that he would fuck it up. <laughs> <laughs> right on. You know, and, and I say that with love for him because he's really transforming lately. He, I'm so, he went to VCon and had like a real moment. Like he's just, my dad has always thought his employees were his enemy because he grew up in, in Russia where everyone stole from the business. My dad is so scared of stealing. Like when one person, when like, you know, they're stealing in a retail store. When one employee steals or a customer steals, it breaks his soul. It's like the thing he fears the most under. And so, you know, I wanted to build the brand because I knew that they weren't going to operate it as well as I did. And that's why I built the wine library brand instead of Shoppers Discount Liquors because I knew I could build something that when I left, and it worked, you know, the decline after I left was slower than it would have been had I not built a brand. When you went to VaynerMedia from that, you had created a brand, but now it, it probably felt like you had to just start over i did start like what over. transpired there essentially right you, with with you well, wanting I, to... I like starting over i'll be honest with you even as you just said that one of the things that sucks of becoming gary v is that i can't truly ever start over again meaning guess, yeah. like you know like it's gonna be like i even yeah. like i'm pumped the nft thing is fucked up right now because everyone's shitting on it and that's like good for me i'm like yeah like, you know, like I like, <laughs> I, I like being underestimated. I like when this it's stacked against me. If I was an athlete, I would have been the kind of athlete that loved to be on the road when everyone's booing you. I love that, you Ooh. know? And so, so I, um, I definitely uh, loved it. So I don't know what else to tell you. Like the economy had collapsed, similar to what might happen right now, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, it was 2009, nobody believed in social media and Fortune 5. It was like all stacked against me. Comedy was crap, I had no money. We started VaynerMedia in somebody else's conference room because I had no money for rent. Mm -hmm. um, uh, nobody in the Fortune 500, Pepsi, NHL, Campbell's, our early clients even knew what social media was. My brother AJ's laptop registered the NHL on Facebook and Twitter, Campbell's Soup on Facebook and Twitter, Pepsi on Facebook and Twitter. Like it was real pioneer shit. You know, it was really fun. I loved it. I love it still today. We're now almost 1,500 employees globally. In 300 in Asia, 300 in Europe, 200 in, in Mexico City. We've got a huge company. And I love the, you know, everybody yells at me for doing it. Everybody around me is mad that I'm the CEO of VaynerMedia because I'm a COO type CEO. I'm in like, I'm in like staffing meetings. And all my friends and fancy people are like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, and, but this goes back to the, you know, I always live the advice I give. I mm. would make a lot, 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 lot more money if I hired a CEO for VaynerMedia. Mm. I just like doing it. How do you handle the stress of being a founder and entrepreneur? I don't have the stress of being a founder and entrepreneur because I found, you know, this is why I don't like Gary Vee. I don't want people to map towards him because he got lucky. I 
have to remind everybody, I'm 46 years old, I'm gonna be 47 in three weeks. I was selling lemonade at six as my hobby. I was selling baseball cards at 10 as my hobby. It snowed in Edison, New Jersey, and I grabbed a shovel in my garage, not ran outside with a sled. I love entrepreneurship and work. I am a very loud advocate that I was a DNF student. That was unheard of. I want everybody to understand this. There's people in their 40s here. That was unheard of in the 80s, especially for an immigrant from Eastern Europe. Unheard of. I am a, I'm no different than an actress, an athlete, a musician. I've been this guy from the beginning. I'm like, I'm like Beyonce, LeBron, not that I'm them in entrepreneurship, but like they didn't know they were gonna do anything else in their whole life, neither did I. So when you ask me do I have stress, I don't have stress, I have gratitude. Every time I'm losing, every time I'm publicly bashed, every time I'm, I'm, I lose money, every t- like I get 39 battle scars a day, but I love it because I don't do this shit for the money or for the fame. I've been doing this long before any of you knew me. I wasn't even a public person until I was 30 years old to remind everybody. Now every person's a public person by the time they're 15 on TikTok. This was not my, this is not what I thought I was gonna do. I was just gonna be a businessman and the world turned in a certain way that worked out for me from a popular culture standpoint, but it is not my addiction. I don't need your attention. I don't need your admiration. I don't, I don't live for it. I just, I, 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 I'm public because I think it's business development strategy, but it is not what I aspire to do. I aspire to be an entrepreneur, so I am doing my life's mission. I'm, I, I feel like I'm a teacher or a guidance counselor or a religious figure. I'm doing my destiny. I'm so fucking happy. Do you understand? I guess I'm trying to figure out what what's gonna excite me or like what, what my next step should be because I think going and continuing to do the same thing is obviously not not gonna be good for my self-esteem or good for me mentally. Like I think I've kind of at this point decided what do I, like I don't want to do this but at the same time I don't know what it is that I do want to do. But I you, guess, like, do I'm you, trying to figure so that out. Can you afford, Andy watch this, you can knock that over. Uh, are you in a place where you can afford um, to go and taste a lot of different things. I think of this like food. People are always like, what's my passion? What do I like to do? I'm like, I don't know. Like if you only eat pizza and hot dogs, how do you not you know, know if you know, foie gras or, or sushi or, or, or lemon soup is your favorite food of all time? I don't know where lemon soup came from. But you know, are you in a place where you can go and try doing different things? And if you can't, Go get a nine to five job that pays your basic life away and then spend your 5.30 p.m. to midnight tasting other things in startup land or internships. That's the actual practical answer to solve this question. Did we lose him? Is that him calling back? Hello? Hello? Yeah, all right, he's done. All right, let's move on. Yeah, I mean, you know, sorry we lost the call. Where, where, where you go when you don't know what you want to do is you have to try to do things. I mean, it's not, not super complicated. So if you've got a trust fund, or if you've saved some money, or if you're living, you know, ghetto and don't give a shit and live with 11 roommates and you know, then, and can afford to just cancel it out. Uh, is uh, what you got to do is you got to go and try things. You got to try operations. You got to try sales. You got to try all these different things. That's really just the only option out there. And so um, you've gotta put yourself in a position, whether being humble and, and ghetto, uh, to go and try things, or maybe you're, luck, you're in a luxury spot where you can go and do that. It's really the only way. You're not gonna find out by guessing. How did you develop a healthy relationship with time, Gary? That's my question. I hung out with 80 year olds when I was a kid. I gravitated towards grandparents and great grandparents um, from a very young age. My best friend when we first came to America because we were poor and everybody was working was my great grandfather. Um, He passed unfortunately a year into being in America but I have always gravitated towards them and what you learn when you spend time with 80 year olds. If I could tell anybody anything here, spend time with an 80 year old that is not your grandparent. Just have a combo, a dinner, uh, strike up a conversation. To this day, the only people I strike up conversations with at airports are people that I think 
look like Yoda. Like are they 90? I wanna talk to them. Uh, because they've lived it, they give you context, and I'm practical. Like you're 36 KP, right? Like think about this. Think about, think about uh, 15 years ago when you were 21. You probably remember your 21st birthday, right? Yep, yep, yep. It feels like yesterday and it feels like seven trillion years ago, right? Right? So if you think about those 15 years, you can think about how much you've accomplished, how much opportunity you had, whether you accomplished it or not, how many reps, how many at-bats, how much time that actually is. Now, what I do is when I'm 36 and I do that 15 thing, then I go, in 15 years I'll be 51. When you hang out with older people, you realize 51's a child. I have unlimited 50, 60, and 70 year old friends who act no different than my 30 year old friends. And so a lot of you see me publicly going deep into youth culture. I love the kids, I love the Gen Zers, the young millennials. Um, But I spend a lot of my not public time with 60, 70, 80 year olds and it's context. And that context allows me to understand. Brilliant, Andrew. Yeah, so follow up around time. So this is from Nina. Um, How do you prioritize your time? How do you make decisions on within, you just gave us a little bit of a sense of (laughs) older versus younger, uh, but how do you just with a thousand priorities in a day say this is what I'm gonna focus on now, today, next? I have three full-time admins and two chiefs of staff. We have a one hour meeting every Thursday to look at the week ahead. We analyze every minute on the minute. The meeting I had right before here was a 15 minute meeting. The meeting before that was a 15 minute meeting. I get a lot done because I believe in 15s. I think everybody in here has one hour meetings that are actually seven minute meetings. You multiply that times 183 meetings a year, you can imagine what ends up happening with efficiency. I go with my intuition and my gut. I've got a ton of things going on. I have eight different companies inside of VaynerX, the holding company, and I'm the active CEO of VaynerMedia. So I'm a chairman of seven other companies within that holding co. I have V Friends, which is taking up an enormous amount of time. I have my family, my personal life, I have my nonprofits, I have Gary V the brand, I have tons of investments, I have a fund, I have a lot going on. But the real answer, and this is gonna be a bomb, the real answer is I don't judge myself when the last week wasn't as efficient as it could have been. The number one reason that people struggle with time management is because they beat themselves up for not having a productive week, day, or year and they don't realize that it's just subjective and they're grading their own homework and they're fucking themselves up. I couldn't agree more. I think the productivity culture is sometimes taking us to the extreme. Yeah, because productivity is subjective. When people are like, Gary, you're saying yes to too many things. I'm like, let me tell you something I said yes to that you would have said no to that led to X and I achieved more financial success with that serendipity than you did with your entire fucking strategy of douchiness. Honestly, what is this? This is karma on top of karma on top of karma. You know, if I can help Andrew, Mazel Tov. If, if that program then helps others uh, at the cost associated with it, Mazel Tov. It's all just fucking good on good on good. And yes, I think the way we do business is gonna be the way everyone does business in the future because it's going to be required to be successful. And if people can move on that version faster, which is more about EQ than IQ, then they'll be more successful and that's what I want for people. Not successful with money, fucking fuck money. Successful with content and joy and happiness. Of course money matters, I don't diss money. I'm an entrepreneur, I gotta buy the New York Jets so that's gonna, I'm not gonna be able to win that. I'm not gonna buy the Jets with hearts, but like, but you can do both. You can, it can be kind and it can be entrepreneurial. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be rugged. Nice guys finish first. The second you figure out that nice guys finish first, not last, is the second good things will happen in your life. My big thing with nonprofits is a couple things and I sit on several boards and spend a lot of time thinking about the marketing of nonprofits. The biggest vulnerability for nonprofits is ideology. Like, it's very awesome that you're passionate about this. But he just might not be. And the ideology and even audacity of some of the people that work or run nonprofits is the thing I'm trying to get them out of. What I'm trying to get the ones I'm involved with is like, cool, let's not convince anybody of anything. Let's disproportionately create stories and let the people that actually care about them consume them. 
And it's a very important framework if you think about how I just talked about that. Don't waste a minute trying to convince somebody who can't be convinced. Right? I mean, you know this, like, I don't want you to be disappointed anymore. Like, that you're passionate about it, I'm passionate about Crohn's and colitis because my brother has it. Like, we can't judge. Like, I love when people judge. Like, and that's what a lot of nonprofits do. Just because you're a fucking nonprofit doesn't mean you're owed anything. It's amazing that you're doing something amazing, so now let's focus on people who we think are, right? And so I think it's about content, marketing, and most importantly, the mindset when we go and talk to people about being appreciative to even get the at-bat to get them to hear about it, but bailing really quick. Like if I'm pitching him on, hey, we're gonna have disability, and I can see his eyes are glossing, thank you so much, man, have a great day. That's how I live my life. I don't expect anything from anybody about anything I'm talking about, and the second I get an indicator that they're not interested, I'm not mad at them. I just wanna move on to the next thing because there's fucking 400 million people to talk to. It's a big mindset shift for a lot of people in profit land. You understand? Yes, very good, thank you. It's a big deal. If you really use that filter, you will be stunned by the adjectives and words you use on email, phone call, and social media that will become the unlock for you actually getting what you want. Make sense? Yes. Cool. You're welcome. It's super important. That was an important moment for a lot of people. Like, when you change your mindset, back to the kind of like weird thing I was doing on stage, like, once you want, like, I could even see like where she was, like, that was fine. I didn't want to let her go because I could tell she's like kind of getting it, right? And it's important to get it because it goes back to entitlement. When you're as wonderful as she is and you're doing something so important for the world, you know, and you see people buying fucking Lamborghinis and fucking $80 this and like, you know, like, and they don't have time for you in this, it's very easy to start to judge, but that becomes your downfall. And when you don't have expectations and when you're not entitled, well, we're a nonprofit, you, sh- you should. I-, I hear that so much in nonprofit boards I'm in. You should. You should what? It's not like we're sitting down with you for four years. You might have a sick grandmother that you like have to take a percentage of your paycheck to just because you're like, you should do nothing. You should be a decent human being, but how that manifests, right? And everyone's posturing. It doesn't take much to put out a tweet that says hashtag me too, but how are you actually living your life? Got it? So we need to eliminate entitlement and judgment. Once you do that, you're in giving mode, not expecting mode. Once you're in giving mode, a very funny thing happens. You start getting. It's not how many likes or followers you get, it's how much value you bring to the people who decided to follow you in the first place. All of a sudden, a funny thing happens. All of a sudden, the nine people that give a fuck about you today tell seven other people because you actually gave a fuck back for them giving a fuck in the first place. Here's the part that I have that is, I've figured out is a magic. Magic. No expectation of others. I do great by him, I do great by him, I do great by him, I eat his shit, I do great, I do great, I do great. Then he goes, does something, something good happens, he can help me, and he doesn't? Mm. For some weird reason, I don't give a fuck. Mm. And so many people get crippled. Mm. When they, so many people do not very little and expect, like, do you know most people give with expectation? Yes. The fuck am I getting out of this? Nothing. Thank you for doing this. I mean, this is your first fucking show. Nine people are gonna watch. That's right. But now, but Nine. now, you're gonna have, do you know what your guests are gonna look like now? Mm-hmm. You're gonna go and fucking say Gary Vaynerchuk was my first fucking guest. You're gonna get 10 times the quality guests you would have gotten. You're gonna get, get guest number four of this show is the quality of the guest that would have been guest 147 right. just by me allocating these 15 minutes. Mm. And that's again an example of giving without expecting in return. That's right. And if you go on to become Larry King mm. and I need to promote some shit in 21 years. Well, you know and, who has you. Or not. And this is the key. That'd be great and I hope so and surely I think about that. But if you said no through your booker, I would never say, I would, I, I would say to the Tyler, I would say to my admin, I would say, that's some shit. I'd be like, fucking motherfucker. Like, you know? But I would never be, that would be, the extent of it would be like, that fucking kid, 
That fucking kid would be nowhere if I didn't do the first fucking, that, which I wouldn't believe by the way, because if somebody gets somewhere, you might've been part of their path, but I don't, you know? Right, right, Maybe right. I accelerated it, but we all accelerate each other. Maybe I wouldn't be where I was if Justin didn't make a video. Like, there's a million what ifs. Here's what I would say. For some reason, after about a minute of being like, fuck that kid, mm. I hope his show gets canceled, mm. you know, like competitive shit, I'd be like, maybe he's in a bad place, maybe he's going through a divorce, maybe he forgot, maybe, maybe he thinks about it differently than I did. I have empathy, man. Mm. Empathy is a powerful drug. Mm. So at 19, you probably had some vision of what your life would look like at 42, right? Yeah. So how does what has actually happened compare to that vision that you had when you were 19? Are you there? Did you meet it? I don't, li- I don't live in the suburbs. Okay. I thought that. Uh, I... I can't see anything else. I knew I'd be successful, like really successful. What told you that? Uh, the fact that I was already successful at 19 selling c- toys and baseball cards and like I was, dude, I wish I was documenting my whole life. Mm. You know, like, like people don't know my true story, meaning people hear the story, I went into my dad's business and did three million, immediately when you hear that statement, you're like, dad put him on. Mm. People don't know that I you know, built my dad's business for him and left Wine Library at 34 with nothing mm. in equity in that company, right? People don't know that like, I never paid myself that much money, so I had not that much money. People don't know what it looks like to have no money and make $3,000 a weekend pre-internet as a 15-year-old in 1990. Mm. That's what I did with no fucking money, motherfuckers. I went, traded with kids, made good trades, went to a baseball card show, sold some, saved my 80 bucks, bought more stuff. Like, it takes talent to make 3,000. You know what I mean? 99% of your audience doesn't know how to make $3,000 a week. Mm. I did that at 15 with no fucking money. Mm. So I knew I was fucking all time. From the get. From the fucking get. You know what I was doing at 19? I was calling my mom at college, crying, saying I don't want to go into the family business even though I want to help because one day everybody will hold that over me and say that I was given something. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't own anything in Wine Library. Ultimately I never wanted anything because I don't want anybody to have any excuse not to chase their dream and work fucking hard Mm -hmm. because I knew I'd be the greatest example of it of all time and I didn't want them to have something on me. I want people to understand, like if you're good enough, you will win. Mm -hmm. You have to be patient and you have to put in the work. Mm -hmm. If this show is gonna be big, it will be big. You just gotta put in the work and put, deploy the patient. So my question is, Please. how uh, can you go into the state of not judging yourself practice. and still keep going? Because I've had it one for like a month and a half. Yeah, practice. I've been focusing on calisthenics and videos. Practice. And I went silence in here. Practice. But then it's, it was gone. Practice. <laughs> you gotta practice. You gotta read the comment and play with it. You suck, you're not funny. Read it, read it, read it. Now here's where it gets good. If you read the comment from somebody saying you suck or you know, or if you're, are you judging yourself or are you getting, or are you struggling with the judgment of others? Somebody saying it's a stupid idea that you're doing this or a comment that's bad. I mean, I didn't get anybody uh, saying it's stupid. A lot of people liking it. Okay. But for me, like continuing the work, I, for this half, a month and a half, uh, month that I've been talking about, I went through like uh, putting my workouts, putting videos, putting funny and videos you burnt and out? stuff. Huh? Are you burnt out? You don't want to do it anymore? No, it's just I, for some reason I slacked and I didn't do anything. I had uh, this conversation with somebody and just <laughs> went out. And Why? I don't know. What do you think? I've been thinking of uh, maybe uh, the combination of two is not good sometimes and it's slowing me down and I'm not putting as much content as I want to. What do you think of the combination like putting sports and good advices and funny videos? Good. (laughs) I think you might be impatient because you went so hard for a month and a half and the numbers didn't get to as high as you want them by going too hard for a month and a half. Right? Because the reason you're asking yourself, is this a good combo, is you didn't see the result that you expected. Let me promise you one way that you can consistently make yourself unhappy. Having expectations. 